welcome everyone. Um, welcome the audience as well to this uh, first online book club as part of uh, Behind the Books, uh, which is an exhibition of the most beautiful Swiss books in London, hosted at Tanner Books. Um, you're welcome to come and visit the exhibition in person. Uh, it's there in the space until the 10th of October, Saturday, 10th of October. It's open Wednesday to Saturday from 12 to 6. And you see, we're really lucky to have worked with architect Takeshi Hayatsu, who's um, created a really nice uh, set design for our exhibition made of paper generously um, donated by Arctic Paper, our sponsors. We also have to um, say thank you to our sponsors this year, which is the Swiss Federal Office of Culture, who is also the original organizer of the Most Beautiful Swiss Books. We also have support from the Swiss Embassy in London. Um, they, both of the Swiss Embassy and the uh, Swiss Federal Office of Culture have been really regular at supporting us. So thank you so much for allowing this to happen. And we also have to thank Tamzin, our host, uh, who is um, the, the, the bookkeeper, the, not the bookkeeper, but the person who runs Tender Books. Tender Books has been hosting our exhibition for the past two years, and it's been really nice being there in the space. So especially in these times where it's really difficult for st shops, independent stores, I would really recommend to go and visit the exhibition and support your local bookshop. Matthias, I think you wanted to say a few words. Um, yeah, I think you said it all. So, okay. uh, I mean, welcome to another year. This year is a bit more special. Um, but yeah, we've been, we've been spending a few days uh, at Tender Books. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been nice discovering the, the selection of books. Um, yeah, I, I, I really highly recommend it. And it's also open on Saturday. Uh, yeah. So for, for our first um, book club, and this is the first of three book clubs, we're really lucky to have two very different graphic design and art direction studios, one based in London and one based in Paris. Uh, we have Studio Art with Guillaume and Daniel, and we have Chaumont Zerpour with Agathe and Philippine. Hi. <laughs> so I'm just going to introduce our guests tonight. And the idea is that each studio is going to present their book and uh, give us a sort of roundup of their ideas and process. And then after both presentations, um, the idea is to open up the conversation. So you're all welcome to ask questions. You can use the chat to do that, or you can also do Q&A, use the Q&A function. I'll be looking at the chat and, and passing the questions onwards. And you're welcome to ask questions at any time, and I'll just pass them on. All right. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Studio Art. Um, Studio Art is a design consultancy, uh, which was founded in 2016. Um, it's two guys, basically. It's Guillaume Schua, who's Swiss. And then we have Daniel Kang Yun Norgaard, who is Danish. And they both met at the Royal College of Art in London. Before they went to the RCA, they both had been working as graphic designers, um, for designers such as Jonathan Harris in Lausanne, or Mavison van Dersen in Amsterdam or again, Graphic Thought Facility in London. Over the past three years, as a studio, they've been working with a lot of different artists, curators, and editors, including Tate, House and Worth, The Drawing Room in London, Soft Opening, the RCA School of Architecture, the Foundation Van Gogh in Arles, and many others. What they specialize in, as you may expect, is editorial design and art direction, and it spans a wide range of medium, which include uh, books, magazines, signage, exhibition design, digital interactive platforms. They are really interested in mixing uh, graphic design languages. So um, they do that through mixing modern and classic approaches or um, analog and digital, um, handmade versus industrial. It's all based on this dichotomy between these two approaches. In 2016, Art took over the art direction of art magazine Tate, etc., the uh, most widely published art magazine, I think, is it in the UK or in the world? I can't remember. Um, published by Tate, of course. And over 10 issues, they developed a really strong independent um, editorial identity, which was quite distinct from Tate's look. Um, they also began collaborating with uh, type designers for each issue, and uh, that led them to win the Swiss Design Award um, a couple of years ago, in 2019, actually, last year. Both of them are also teaching regularly at the London College of Fashion and at ICAL 
in Lausanne. With, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Guillaume and Daniel, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jonas, for this very nice introduction. Um, yeah, you said it all. Uh, we, yeah, I think we, at the studio, we do different things. Uh, we don't do enough books, but when we do books, then we really um, like enjoy it and and like push uh, things as far as we can. And and I think like the book that we're gonna show tonight was like started from a very low key um, like a context for for a quite small gallery, uh, which is the drawing room in London. Um, they've been there for a while, but they um, and it's a non it's a non profit organization uh, that specialized um, in drawings. Um, so like a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, they put together an exhibition about drawings um, and trying to basically bring uh, a quite broad uh, view of how nature influences human and how you nature is represented um, in art, but more specifically in, in drawing. So it ended up being like a, a group show um, and uh, which was like um, basically a, a collections of, of different uh, artist work. Um, and they commissioned us to make, to make a book and they had a very tight budget, uh, which is also something that really in, like uh, informed the design of this book because we, we also had to we had to to do a lot with a very like very little money, which I think that's also pushed us to to the simplicity of of the object. Um, I think also what you won't see in the design and the execution is also the work put behind it due to the low budget. Um, so we had to. Um, like do a lot of the things ourselves like by hand and source things from elsewhere than just going through one specific source like the prints or things. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, so I think basically it's a very simple idea, but we, we had, we were very much influenced by herbarium uh, and the way people collect plants and people at home press plants and, and how, how like a plant can take over um, some paper and, and leave a trace. And, and I, think, I think that's something we're quite interested in our practice is to bring some sort of na narrative around objects and, and maybe the book becomes a props of its own story. So we kind of, yeah, kind of like really push this idea that, you know, this object that was a new catalog could also have been somewhere else before that. Um, and and also like the, the art that was um, like shown in the exhibition included a lot of work from people who who collected plants that this is for instance uh, Derek Jarman's um, diary and and that's also where the the title of the exhibition is from is uh, Mother Nature which is a, a term that he he brought up um, um, so we started to look into like yeah, the 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 classification of plants and how they preserved, and and then got very obviously this is very graphic. It's very like exciting and it has so much vernacular and so much uh, you know it's also to do with type. It's to do with cause and and with many different things, and and I think like we I think maybe that was also a starting point. We really like um, this. Um, Biela, this is like typical Swiss uh, folder, and it has the exact same color of that thing. We're trying to really match it, and they're like really beautiful. and And this is actually at the beginning what we wanted to do. I think is to to make a folder uh, or to get a folder already made and then like customize it. But um, that was impossible, too expensive, or we didn't get didn't get through. So I think this is why we ended up like trying to find a way to make a folder that is very simple. Uh, we'll, we'll show you the, the book um, after, but maybe we just want to say the story about the, the cover, which is interesting because first we, we wanted, I think 
like normally in an art books, you put like an artwork on the cover and that's what we're trying to do at first. But then the, you know, using this kind of bleach, sun bleach things on an artwork was a bit too intrusive. So this is why we, we kind of had to look for another thing to bleach out of the paper. And one of the, the artists that was exhibited in, in there was uh, some um, Margaret Me, which is, she, she was a scientific, uh, one of the only woman scientific um, botanists who would go um, in, in the Amazonia to, to document uh, a very famous plant, uh, a very rare plant, actually a very a rare flower, which will only like open once during the night and then dies out. So this was the plan. We're like, oh, this is it. We have a, some, we have a props. We have something we can put on the cover, but that is not an artwork. So we're not like actually going too much into, you know, like messing around with the art. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's one of the pieces that was in, in, the, in, the, in the exhibition. Um, and this is how it looks when you, because what is great with all these environments is that they're scanned in HD and accessible from this university. So you can go through, you just know, need to know the exact name, scientific name, which was hard, but um, so yeah, I think basically we, 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 we faked it completely and, and we spent a lot of time trying to fake it as much as we, like as well as we could, which, which worked quite well because some people really thought that it was actually you know, bleached out. Um, I think also the fact that we did not use uh, one specific artist or one specific artwork on the cover also helped to democratize the cover and talk more about the overall motivation for the exhibition rather than highlight a single a single piece or, or a single artist. Yeah. Um, I guess that's what with art show, you always put like, either you put the title of the show so you know, no one is end up being like privileged. And I think in, in relation to that, actually, if you just go one up, then the the title of the show is very, it's quite small. So it, like, it's really not overpowering in any way. So it really becomes, it's like, um, it's almost like a, uh, what's it called? Like a, like an outcome of a process, just like the the, the fake somewhere is. And, and just like, you'll see like the object it actually is. It's, it's, it's such a, the subtle sort of gesture, but it, it, it kind of ties in with the whole idea and the whole approach to both to the exhibition, I think, but also um, to, to our design of the book. Yeah, and then I think this follows just the process of like all these stamps, we didn't invent them. They're like present in all this mm -hmm. barrier. Uh, so we just basically made, like use it up to, to display the exhibition title. And I think once we were there, we kind of, we push the idea f like further. And I think one something, that's something we got also quite influenced was like a book that my father had given to my brother and for Christmas and he had written something in there and, and, and it had bleach on the inside cover, which is, you know, that's how like we had this idea that was, you know, this, this idea of like the wood, the wood in the paper reacting to the ink. And, and this is just a continuation of nature in some ways because, because the wood would get more like the fiber that you know the paper is made of, which comes from the wood, will get yellower under acid at like some acid or some light or something. So I think what we, what we like is that we also kind of trying to bring nature back into the paper or, you know, like raising like an idea of something that is still alive, uh, even though it's well dead, but then, you know, it's still like has, you know, something to, to say. Like everything is comes from somewhere. Everything is an effect of something. Um, so here, yeah, you can see that that was just this very simple, low engineered, like a low intervention folder, which was just folded twice um, to contain the, the thing. Because also one, one aspect was that the curator absolutely didn't want to wrap, to shrink wrap the book, which is, 
you know, for something that's not bound is a bit like a bit risky. So, so we had to come up with something, and this is also why we. That's we, because we, it was it's it's plastic. Yeah, because it's plastic. That's why we we came up with this idea of uh, having this paper bag, basically, which we we found ourselves in in like a, a French shop, uh, and then that also informed the the squareness, the little square on the on this, which comes from also from this labeling uh, that is. Uh, as a very scientific um, feel. Um, and if we move on, like, I think, yeah, the, the inside, we, like, again, we were very interested in the mix of type and mix of language, which this folded hat, just like all these scientific uh, folded hat. And, and, and we really like this idea that we will mix, basically, we could like overlay to different publication grids uh, to kind of create like something a little bit tricky. Uh, so like all the scientificness of the, 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 of the publication runs at the bottom. Like in here, you can see footnotes, which we felt was actually the, the kind of quite scientific aspect of a publication. And, and then they move on to the plate section. So you can you can't see it here, but it's like two different papers. So I think one one really be, feel like it belonged to something, and the other one belonged to something else. Um, but apart from that, it's a very simple book. It is a very simple book, and it's meant to be simple. It's um, you know it is just some folded sheet together, uh, which yeah are like wrapped into this you know simple folder. Um, but I think that's maybe why why it is successful because it has very like a very simple, quite strong idea. Yeah. Um, it's also I mean it's it's a lot of it is also the execution of the like the like Guillaume mentioned like the law intervention like it, it's it's really there's no binding, nothing is really holding it together other than itself. So it's really. Um, it's still like sticking to to the idea and and sort of um, um, what's it called um, utilizing the the properties of of the of the board for the for the cover and the fact that when you fold things you know they they kind of hold together. Yeah, um, and maybe I mean that's if we want to go a bit more nerdy, like the font was like one of the font is called Media 77 and it's like a very, it's quite, it's like a revival of um, more or less classic fonts. And, and, the, um, and the other one is um, Souvenir, or like a monospace version of Souvenir, which is actually very floral, but has this uh, archival, quite scientific look in a way. So, and this font, yeah, we tweaked a little bit to, to bring more of the typewriter feel uh, to it, which we added, like the underlining of, yeah, the underlining bit. Plus, we we increase the size of the punctuation uh, because that's a very typewriter thing. But this is like small little detail, which you know, kind of made made the made the book what it is. Uh, but we, I think we saw, or uh, like Jonah Jonah suggested that we. Um, maybe um, share like, you know, a handling of the book. Um, you share, and we're gonna try that now. And then maybe we move, if we have some time, we can move very quite quickly on like other project that we've been working on recently. I think you connects, oh yeah, then you do this. Um, yeah, and then what is it? I think video has got a bit more. Um, yeah, so like as we said, so I can, you know, um, so 
This is the, the, the paper, the paper envelope. The upside down. Yeah, no, just look at um, and this is all hand bound, like we are, we kind of put it together. Um, and so, yeah, this is the publication. So you can see like very, it's very simple, like a simple sheet open, which is actually just uh, printed with a, like a tint of yellow, like a, a, really, a really light yellow. Um, on the book. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is it. So this is like a non-coded stuff, and this is like a very like more arty um, like silk material. Silky material, um, but yeah, I think you know. All in all, it doesn't have glue. It doesn't have a pack. Really, a real packaging. It also this idea that it is completely recyclable and doesn't leave, like you know, in theory, should not be leaving a trace in the nature. And I think that was you know, as as we said at the beginning, this is what led uh, a little bit. Of the design and the uh, and and the choice, which also became uh, yeah graphic choice uh, choices. Um, yeah, um, I think that's 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 it. That's what we can say about the 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 book itself. Um, now I don't know if there's like questions uh, we can we 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 can answer or or we can also do a little. Uh, overview of like what's cooking uh, in the studio. Great. Jonas. Thanks, Guillaume and Daniel. Um, I, th I suggest we keep the questions for the end. And if we have more time at the end, it'd be great to hear more about your practice. Um, yep. And I'd like to introduce our next guests, um, Philippine Chaumont and Agathe Zerbo, who are joining us from Paris. Very glamorous. Um, Agat and Philippine met at ECAL, where they were both studying graphic design. And uh, it's quite interesting because the, although they met doing graphic design, their practice has really changed since their diploma. So they met at ECAL and then they um, basically bonded together and they've started working together and never left each other since. It's been six years now, hasn't it? And they've uh, worked between Lausanne and Paris. Um, and from the very first projects that they started doing together, they put images at the center of their graphic design practice. Um, that kind of led their first jobs to be uh, mainly for fashion brands. And quite naturally, fashion obviously needs more images than micro typography. And that's how they ended up uh, using more and more photography for their work. Photography that they also took themselves. Um, for about two years now, uh, they mostly do photography and photo book projects. They also do art direction and they work for a lot of, uh, for, for quite a few fashion brands, um, sometimes who ask them to do both graphic design and photography. So they've got basically the, the, um, the two skills, the, they're the Swiss army knives of graphic design. They do both image and uh, type, obviously. I have none of the skills. <laughs> <laughs> They have no skills, sorry, I lied. <laughs> um, thank you, Philippine and Agat, for joining us tonight. Really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you for having us. So I'm Agat, here is Philippine. Uh, as you told, uh, we are, we was graphic designer, but now we are more photographer. Oh, sorry, sharing the screen. Uh, as I get, we start talking about uh, what we do as photographers. I will show you a few recent uh, commissioned work. So as uh, graphic designers, we were making mostly books and we have always been interested by images. Books were just a good pretext for us to play with 
images and after working more and more on editorial projects, it took us a while, but we realized that we were more, we finding more excitement doing the content and producing images than play with the grids or the typography. Uh, one of our first jobs together was a book for a fashion brand in Paris called Jack Mus. So here are a few spreads from this very first book we made together. Uh, they, they asked us to help them with the design of the book, but also to create the content. A part of our job was to reunite uh, artists and produce images with them. We ended up with like strong and really colorful images. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but when there is only strong images in the edit, the edit can sometimes be a bit flat. Uh, so we really started to make images, to use them as a tool to arrange our edits, like very simple stuff, still live, uh, just to add some hair and rhythm to the book. So it's how we start. Yes. Uh, after that, more and more clients ask us for photography, not just for yeah. graphic design. Now we're back to our photos. <laughs> yeah. So it was really a strange period of time because we struggled so much to become a graphic designer. We couldn't say we was actually a photographer. Mm -hmm. And uh, above all, we was really bad with techniques in photography. So now it's fine, but it's it was, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with time, we realized that because of our graphic design background, our early photo work was really focused on spreads rather than single image images. So. When we shoot, we tend to think always of the series in an editorial format. We always tend to have in mind the InDesign document rather than a single perfect picture hanging on the wall. We think in terms of spreads, amount of pages, contrast, margins, and rhythm. In what we are showing now, maybe you will see some images where we think the spreads are stronger than the images themselves. People often ask, how, how is it to work as a duo? I don't know for you, but uh, we heard that in some photographers duo, one is in charge of the technical aspects, for example. The other one is more with the content, the concept or one is shooting and the other one is speaking to the models. But the weird thing with us is we do the same things in the same time. We have uh, two identical camera. I don't know if it's really efficient, but it's the way we do. It's really not. <laughs> yeah. And um, so the very, very first photo project we did together was actually the dummy of the book uh, that was awarded this year. And as Jonas told you, we started this project uh, for our diploma at ECAL. Yes. And while I get with you some spreads from this book, I will tell you a bit more about it. Um, a year later after the diploma, a copy of this dummy was exhibited at the uh, Winterthur Photo Museum during an event called Platform. And that's where and how we met uh, Winfried Henninger, who would become our publisher. Um, he saw the book and offered us to publish it. Um, and we had never thought of this uh, diploma project as something that could become a real book. So with this, uh, with this news started like a huge excitement along with a lot of problems. Like um, the first one was the object. The dummy we had made for the diploma was very big, like almost half a meter long and above 650 pages. So it was quite a lot. So basically the first two years of the process of making this book were uh, mostly uh, about applying for grants and prizes to be able to print it and slowly by slowly uh, downsizing it a little bit. <laughs> And the second and most important question was, um, why does this book need to be published and what exactly is it about? Because fashion in Kenya was a bit too wide. And I think that during our first trip and the first versions of this uh, book, <clears throat> we were mostly focused on visuals. And we, the first time we went to Kenya, we were like 
tourists, complete tourists, and really just fascinated by everything that was before our eyes. And with a little bit more distance, a few years later, after the diploma, we went again through all the images. And if some were really good by accident, uh, most felt a bit empty. And I think this uh, feeling of emptiness also came from the fact that um, another thing about the diploma dummy was that it was filled with Wikipedia text because it was the graphic design diploma. We kind of had to put a lot of um, big text, small text, uh, titles, subtitles, captions, <laughs> footnotes, everything for you. <laughs> all, all, all you can eat. <laughs> and um, it was the, <clears throat> our first, I would say, emergency to go back to Kenya and create new text contents. And of course, because we are not authors at all, <laughs> We thought um, the best and um, easiest way for us to uh, get nice texts would be to make interviews and have discussions with the people we had met on our first trip and uh, schedule meetings with people we wanted to ask specific questions to, like stylists about the fashion industry in this country in general, how, how, to, how does the, I don't know, magazine editorial part of the fashion works in Kenya but also factories about the textile industry and that has collapsed over the like, past decades in East Africa. All kinds of fashion professionals. So we went back to Nairobi and uh, not sure what we were doing then. And I think these interviews and in, of, like, this new approach um, is how we started asking ourselves the right questions and, the, and like finally be able to put a hand on what was the topic of the book. It's definitely a photo book. It's like 90% photos and maybe 10% text. But it's weirdly through the text that we were um, able to find the right way and reconsider the way we were shooting, making the images and arranging them together. And so during this new photo trip, um, the question that originally I think was about like fashion designers and the fashion week in Nairobi and the fashion industry, the question became more about what do people actually wear in Kenya? And throughout the whole trip and all the encounters with it, um, we kept navigating between the three main uh, sources of clothing, which are the first local fashion designers and tailors and artisans and so things that are made in the country, which are unfortunately for the most unaffordable as most of the raw material is uh, imported. Um, then mass quality, mass produced, uh, low quality, uh, yet still really expensive garments from India and China and Asia in general. And finally, the third one who caught our interest the most, I would say, um, the Mitumba trade. Mitumba means secondhand clothing in Swahili. And it's uh, basically all um, the clothing that comes from our Western donations, like the Red Cross or Salvation Army, things that we give away. It's a business that has emerged over the past three decades, along with the death of the textile industry in, uh, yeah, in East Africa in general. Um, and it's really linked to the death of the textile industry. There's many countries like uh, Tanzania, I think, but many countries in East Africa try to put a ban on these imports of used clothing because nobody can compete with uh, free clothes that are sold to like for 20 cents a t-shirt. Anyways, <laughs> and these used clothes are exported from Europe. They are often sorted and baked in the the United States where like sorting factories are most of the times and then exported to Africa and sold at low cost and in very high volumes to the African buyers ending up distributed through like small local markets. And these markets are where a very vast majority of people uh, buy their clothes from. So the book kind of became about the life of these clothes and the travels around the world and this, all this, this, this cycle of clothing around the world and oh, the people who wear them and how they wear them. These clothes that have been worn by 
hundreds of people before. And we also really wanted all these different levels of, an, of the fashion economy uh, to intertwine in the book and for all of them to be informed by the people we met. So clothing designers and wearers alike. And maybe I guess you can show some, if you manage to plug the iPhone, some, alors, the book in real life. Ici, ça t'arrive. Sorry, <laughs> coming. Ah, ah c'est bon. Okay. Hop. It's a shame you can't see our setup. Um, and so, as I was explaining, um, these three uh, big parts of the um, where clothing comes from uh, in, in Kenya became really important for us. So we decided to organize the book and our images according to the three clothing sources. Um, so the title is Things People Wear in Kenya. And um, there was kind of three answers to that. So there are the things that are made locally, these local designers and uh, factories and tailors. Then the new things from the East, which are all the Asian imports. And finally, uh, old things from the West, which are our donations imports. Um, about how we shot the images and organized them in the book. Um, there were all the images you can see in this, um, in this, well, this part, for instance, were originally shot as separate series and we, we've had always been introducing them as separate series in the previous dummies of the book. So each series would leave from a point of interest. It could be very various uh, throughout all the trips we took to Kenya. So first trip was mainly series, well, many series like about designers. So we had a designer in mind, we would contact them and organize a proper fashion shoot with a model on, on, in a location. But some shoots also left from the idea of documenting the clothing from one specific market in a specific area of the country. So we would hear about this uh, nice market in the north of Mombasa, just go there, collect some clothes and find the best way to photograph them. And after gathering all these series together, we had about, I would say 30 or 40 series, all talking about a small specific topic. We arranged them within the three big parts of the book and we thought it would be nicer to have them all mixed up. Um, this way they could maybe evocate the way we had ourselves um, discovered all the layers of the fashion industry in Kenya. And also like, um, like with, so by, we were going back and forth from a topic to another and this so in the book, you can you meet someone and you see him 100 pages later, which was kind of like the way we took this trip. And also for them to be all mixed uh, in each chapter that would allow them to uh, talk in a more general and efficient way about what each chapter is aiming to say. And about how we distributed and designed the text. Um, well, we came back with tons of interviews. It was hell to uh, rewrite them. And then we had help from good friends. And then um, each of the three parts starts with um, interviews with fashion professionals. So designers, stylists, um, textile historians, and people who could uh, really re answer us and the like, questions we had on the industry in general. And each part of the book ends with uh, shorter interviews that are discussions we had with the people we met. So it's mostly about the wearers of the clothing. And all these interviews, the big and the small ones, um, start with a small uh, line of page numbers that are references to 
these people inside the book in the images. So because after mixing all these people, these images, these places and stuff, we kind of had to link them at some point. And if you can, yeah, you can see the um, pieces of a designer after reading his interview, or you can see the face of an artisan after reading his interview. And um, the design in general, um, if I had to say a few words about it, I think we tried to, we kind of wanted the reading experience of the book to feel with like the mass of images and their rhythm and the way they are disorganized to give the reader um, the feeling of dizziness you can experiment when you're browsing piles and bales of clothes in a Mitumba market. Um, in order to push this impression, we thought the object needed to be quite flexible so you can go smoothly uh, through the 500 images that are in there. <laughs> And because it's such a chunk, we also wanted it to be uh, as light as possible. So we went for quite a voluminous paper. And in conclusion, if, if, if we have to say conclusion, <laughs> we would say that um, in, like, in the work we do as photographers, but I think it's even more as graphic designers and um, book uh, book designers, <laughs> we always have a hard time linking, well, for us, maybe it's also a thing of like, because we're so immature, <laughs> but a, a hard time um, linking the visuals and what we feel like doing as visual makers um, and the meaning, like what the book, is, the book is aiming to say. And we could say that overall with this book, um, having created all contents from A to Z uh, and made us like so close to the subject that uh, it really helped us to change our approach and understanding of how we should really work as designers and photographers in general. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Really good, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I want to ask our audience um, if they have any questions, they can use the Q&A uh, function or they can also use the, the chat. Um, I'll be checking the chat. Um, while the audience is kind of coming up with their questions or gathering their thoughts, I uh, have a couple of questions for um, both of you. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to say thank you both, obviously, for, the, for taking the time to prepare this presentation and uh, showing us the book. The books. Um, one thing that kind of struck me is how Philippe de Nagat said when you decided to um, publish this book that's when the problems began. Notably this notion of trying to find a budget, trying to apply for funding etc. And this is also something that uh, Guillaume and Daniel mentioned isn't it? This idea that um, if you want to do an interesting book then you're kind of stuck uh, quite directly stuck by the amount of money. So you end up doing a lot of things yourself. So maybe I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this aspect of uh, the process, both of you. You want to start? No, no, go for it. Because I think we, we explained quite, quite a bit, like already was the, what was the, like quickly, maybe we just, yeah, the thing about not being afraid of doing things by hand, not being afraid of involving the client in like printing the book. And I think if people don't have much money, I think that's while it's, um, you know, it is an issue and it creates like, it is much creating much more work for us. It is also an opportunity to make something a bit more crazy. And also because there's a question, like there's obviously the, the production money, but then also, the design fee and then usually a rule like that's not universal but like the slow the smaller the the, the fee is the more freedom we, we we would we would get so which you know in a sense i think like the drawing rooms understand they understand that and they understood, understood that for that project and we also and or maybe they just trust us but then i think you know sometimes when there's too much money then there's also too much pressure and and you don't want to be, you know, like, like, I don't know, fucking up, 
you know, with like too much, you know, too too much too much project, too much uh, yeah clash. Well, I think there's also this idea of a lot of times, for instance, books is is fairly often something quite personal, especially within the creative industry, that it's it's an artist or like several people that's initiated a project like you've done. Um, and then working with designers, it's 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 a different it's a different dynamic because the project that you want to publish is like your little baby quite often. So then a lot of times you people are willing to actually put a little bit of extra effort into it, be, like just because they're a bit more passionate about it. Whether um, like in relation to other industries where they, you know it's just a matter of typesetting, getting it out and selling the thing. Um, and the author has nothing to say. Uh, it's uh, it's we're, we're quite sort of fortunate in that way, I think, and with a lot of projects that people are willing to sort of actually consider putting in like a day of like putting stuff in a bag and or like putting stickers on on, on the front pages of things. Mm -hmm. How about you guys? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, this is so different because you are you are your own client in some way, which is, you know, it's great and horrible at the same time. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we totally uh, feel really? the same with that. Yeah, as designer, we mostly we push against people, and then this is what gives us like a bit of you know uh, confidence sometimes. And then, but then when you have to do, and it's quite rare that we self-publish things. But uh, yeah, we don't have. So I can imagine that must be. You know, mm -hmm. Money is one thing, but also it's just your own evil mind that you have to fight against, right? Yes, yes. Well, and on yeah, on the creative part, uh, the publishing house letters really uh, gave us really a lot of freedom. Yeah, and it's also probably has to do with the fact they didn't give us any money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. freedom, yeah. freedom is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> So it sounded like it was quite a long process with the publishing house. It was really a long process. It was a long process. Yeah. I think, well, also because we were, of course, not working on it uh, as a full-time full job, as a full-time project. Uh, any commission job was going first. Um, so it could have taken half of this time. But it was good that way. We also needed a bit, dist a little bit of distance on, on these mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, the, the money process process for sure was quite long when we did uh, other books for brands fashion brands for instance it usually takes six months <laughs> but then they maybe feel more like a magazine than a book yeah no it's different but yeah mm -hmm. um both of your projects deal with the idea of the vernacular so the idea of finding um interesting visual elements in everyday culture um Guillaume and Daniel, could you tell us more about how you use that in your work? You mentioned it briefly with the typeface, um, linking the sort of reference of these archival images, but what else did you use in your work? Um, like you mean like in terms of like sourcing very different, like things from very different places? Yeah, and also kind of dealing with references, because it's always interesting to see Obviously, you have this very clear reference of, you know, the, the plates uh, or like people drying stuff, but then yeah. that goes further, the, the aspect of the vernacular in the book. Um, and, or maybe, maybe this is something that's more obvious in other works, I don't know, but I feel like this is something you often come back to, this idea of quoting, like, from elements of popular culture. It's funny because we were just quick, briefly talking about it before we went, went on this that it's a lot of times we uh, we find ourselves kind of just talking about this sort of almost like hijacking a format or hijacking like something already existing, which I think the, the, the book that we just show you is, is, a, is a really good example of how you can basically like it's, you know, like it, it is to a certain degree like hijacking something and then the matter of like molding it into like a communication tool almost, um, which I think in, all in all, I think, I think it's something that we more or less consciously do every almost every time. Whether it comes from like whether it comes from an actual folder or it comes from something online or like an interface from 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 a uh, from a from a application on the computer. It's 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 still it's still the same approach. Basically. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we like. I think we. 
maybe we are quite we're trying to be quite expressive in what we do and then we tend to avoid the sometimes or as much as we can the kind of swiss automatic one size regular font and because we know that it's this this is working and like you know and everyone that's why everyone is doing it and this is great we we enjoy it very much but i think sometimes we this is maybe our urge to kind of trying to bring something else on the table and and go away from like swiss style or like or or maybe Dutch style because like Daniel studied in the, Net- in the Netherlands but like you know this like this book doesn't have much of a Swiss book like it's it's very it actually very English in a way like it's got like this kind of a classic grid and 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 I think that's also because you know because we also in 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 the UK and we get influenced by but but I think also just on that on that it's also um when you t- like it kind of leads and it kind of links on to like a question of style and like the recognition in terms of visual recognition and, like a lot of people you know in certain you know a lot of studios you can kind of you can get you can see that it comes from somewhere you can see it comes from a specific studio whereas i think i think that we we you can't really see it in that way it's more the I, like the the approach it's more the approach behind like that's yeah, behind the scenes in that way that's that's important to us so that's that, interesting yeah. i guess like people may lots of people may not know what we do but we also work like on as you said on the on, on the magazine and and that's a that like complete diff, like different different story we like what we do in books we don't do in magazine and i think what we do in magazine is like pushing to the extreme like these things about like bringing uh like a typographic language that will not survive one more than you know two months because it's too wacky and 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 i think that's interesting because and that's what we why we like magazine also design it's a it's very interesting and but then what you do in magazine you don't do in books and and you know while i don't mean like this this is wacky in any way but it, it just you know, it's very bookish, uh, but I think like the, the work we did for 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 the Tate uh, is this you know more like um, expressive. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very like yeah, it's far from a book design, or at least from from a Swiss maybe book design um, spirit. Yeah. This kind of brings me to a question for Philippe and Nagat. I mean, it's kind of a, <laughs> it may sound like a tricky question, but actually I was, because you, you quite often have this uh, difficult relationship between graphic design and photography, and you've kind of talked about how you've evolved from one to the next. Can you tell us a bit more about how that happened, this thing of like leaving ICAO as like graphic designers and then increasingly using photography and then having to fight to be also recognized as photographers? I think we didn't really have to fight to be recognized as photographers. It's a bit weird, but it all started with jobs. So the, I feel like what we're fight, fighting against is more like uh, between us. We're not fighting together, but what, uh, what, we want to what we want to do as photographers, we started right away by working. I don't know how that happened. Like, I guess one job brought another one. And well, we decided to uh, push for it because photography feels uh, in the middle of graphic design sometimes like a workshop you know with photography you get a result in one day and then you see it and you have it in your hands and it's over and you can do the next thing and Mm -hmm. that has something really exciting I guess if we were doing only photography no books no no, nothing else maybe we'd be frustrated about it Mm -hmm. but uh, yes the uh, fact photography so image um, was really something that made us want to do it more But then, yeah, jobs came by themselves, not many, but a few. (laughs) Uh, And and it just, at some point, uh, we, I guess, like a year ago, a year and a half ago, we we sat and we were like, okay, it's been, uh, I don't know, um, 10 editorials and 10 uh, commercial jobs that we do. And we we have no idea who we are as photographers, as graphic designers. It's something we had had the time to push and search at school and you, you and at, during our internships and various jobs we had before starting the studio 
but as uh, photographers, we were just uh, the victims of what was happening. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But it's also more immediate, so maybe uh, it, it can come more naturally. And I think we kind of also did our photography um, education also at Ecal and but the, when looking at magazines, uh, I'm supposed to look at the grid and the font system. We kept looking at the images. But yeah, also the, because we are working in the fashion field, I think mm -hmm. it helps to do both. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like in the fashion field, the position of photographer is more respected than designer? Yes. It's, yeah. Um, it's easier to understand. Yeah. Maybe. Like for with graphic design and art direction, we've had a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but it happened, um, like credits issues. It's, oh, right. Yeah. Um, and it's always fine by us, but the, it's crazy how, yeah, in fashion, uh, I mean, someone who designs a logo is something very clear in the most uh, people's minds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, someone who, Edits images is something a bit more difficult to get and to credit. Yeah. Uh, kind of getting near the end of our time. So I was just uh, asking our audience who's still there. I know uh, if they have any questions, this is the time to ask. Uh, otherwise, it'll be too late. And while you're thinking about it, oh, Laurent Benner. Oh, thank you all. Loved both presentations. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you for the support. <laughs> and um, otherwise, I have one last quiz, quick question, which is, what are you working on at the moment? What's your next project? Um, Agathe and I, we are well, starting, trying to start a new book. Um, this time, we want to try to do it with what is around ourselves, not, um, not, not, so not have to travel <laughs> 5,000 kilometers away. I think it's, um, it's a good time to try a book like that. <laughs> And it's also about, uh, it kind of like, it's, it's just a beginning, but kind of like a study of clothing and its various meanings. And otherwise, um, a lot of commissioned work mm -hmm. coming, for trying to get uh, nice editorials for this season. Excited to show them. <laughs> nice. You guys? Uh, yeah, so we're going to do a bit of promotion. We just got that one from the printer, Good to Bound. It's a, it's, it's a catalog um, uh, for the art, an artist called Tenant of Culture. Uh, she's an um, emerging artist who works with um, like clothing, like used clothing, and like recreate sculptures and, and, and fashion. Uh, not she doesn't create yeah she creates clothing but really the not in an in an artistic way they they not really wearable but they it's all this idea of like recycling and then like kind of like using like telling the story behind the clothes and and using the traces and so we made a, a publication and it was an amazing um project because uh yeah, we had a little bit of money, but also great people to work with, and and it was very collaborative, and everyone brought like something. And we also for this one, which is very rare, but we like we also directed the photography, uh, which is. Um, Sorry, this is Guillaume, yeah. just a question: Can you repeat the name of the the artist? The artist is called Tenant of Culture. Is that reversed? No, it looks good on our side. It's just somebody from the audience. Uh, Anna is the. Uh, it's her name is uh, Henrike uh, Schimmel. Uh, she's uh, um, Dutch. She was born in in, in the Netherlands. Uh, she's based in the UK. So yeah, look up her work. And the book is coming out like next um, in a week, Saturday in a week. And this was the idea was to make like um, it basically trying to like use the same approach as she does and create like an, a kind of patchwork of different books. So this is like a, a lot of different material which will, will be like kind of like bound together um, and, and there's different like printing things and then there's also reference to fashion, uh, fashion story with like this kind of fashion ad. There's an amazing text by um, Jeppe uh, Uglevig. Um, um, he's like really like a really interesting guy, uh, and then obviously a, a long play section with um, a lot of nice reproduction and some things that falls that's not bound that are not like cuts and 
so this it's a monster and it's it's um yeah basically a, like trying to kind of echo a little bit of the work so um, but yeah, yeah, it's going to be available at tender books so whoever wants to, like oh maybe the exhibition is going to be already finished no in the tents well maybe the last day of the exhibition the book is going to be going to be available there so yeah that's it great well thank you so much both of you um it's been a pleasure to have you there um i hope everybody enjoyed from the audience uh, i just want to remind everyone that we have two more of these book clubs coming up we have one on the 6th of october uh, with Adeline Mola and Matthias Clotu with editor Sarah Handelman. Then we have one on the 8th of October with Dan Solbach and one guest, which is still TBC. So thank you everyone. And I hope to see you all soon very um, in real life. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.